soy. I don't know why it's got that name in it. Um, and then nut consumption correlates with re reduced coronary artery disease. So you can kind of read through some of this. By the way, this, this presentation, since it has, it has a ton of information in it, um, feel free, is it okay, Laura, for them, where should they should email you for um, a copy of the presentation so you'll have all the information? Okay. So nuts is on here. We've heard a lot about nuts. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and move on over to um, some of the cancer-fighting foods real fast. I think that this is really interesting because this is fascinating to me because there are different stages of cancer development, okay? And it takes 10 to 40 years sometimes. Um, you can be in the middle stage of what we call the latent phase where things are reversible, you know? If you're doing good nutrition, you can actually reverse, reverse the chances that that's leading to cancer. So this is impactful. Um, so basically, um, Cancer can be caused by external factors and internal factors. What I want to do real fast is go through the stages of development. There's something called initiation. And this is when you have that single normal cell that's going to turn into a cancer cell. It involves genetic damage or alteration of cellular DNA by a carcinogen, which is a substance that tends to stimulate cancer. So example, this is why you hear a lot about smoked foods, nitrate containing. These are, con con these are called um, initiators. So in other words, they can cre create the initial damage to that cell. Okay, happens rapidly and although initially reversible, it can later become irreversible. It does not alone cause cancer, but a cell that's been altered or mutated will now can pass um, that information down to its daughter cells and that's the potential to become cancerous as time goes. So promotion's the next stage. It involves, you have this initiated cell, right? And now it's being repetitively exposed to what we call promoters of cancer. This is where high fat diet is considered a promoter of cancer. Um, it's been linked to promotion of colon, breast, endometrial, prostate cancer. It occurs over a long period of time. The period of time between exposure to a promoter and the development of a malignancy can be 10 to 40 years. So that's why we focus a lot on, you'll see these conditions crop up with people who have long-standing diets. So almost everybody that comes to me that has had colon cancer, high, high red meat diet. That's highly and high fat diet in addition to that. Has um, been long-standing for years. And progression. An irreversible sequence involving malignant cell behavior, invasion of adjacent tissues. So this is pretty much where it is irreversible at this stage. Um, so we have lots of things that cause cancer, right? Um, so what I think you'll find is that genetics plays about 10%, okay? So where does everything else, what, what happens? Well, it can come from things that are just natural in our environment, like geophysical, 3%. Our occupational hazards, sometimes pollution, industrial products, medicines, our x-rays, all those things we do for screening. Viruses, Epstein-Barr has been linked to, hepatitis B, um, human papillomavirus, all those things. Those are responsible for about 10% of cancers worldwide. And then you've got those lifestyle factors that you can control. And what we're finding is tobacco use, diet, alcohol, excessive exposure to sunlight or tanning beds, sexual behavior patterns, general personal hygiene, um, diet, um, seems to be 35% um, related to cancer mortality, tobacco 30, um, alcohol 3, reproductive sexual behavior 7. Smoking remains the most preventable cause of death in this country. We talked about how it can cause cardiovascular disease by causing the lesions on the inside of the arteries. But smoking, um, of course, the carcinogens that are in smoking, we all know about that. If someone consumes alcohol heavily, um, in addition to smoking, they work synergistically to, con to, to produce cancer. So they're much, much more at risk if they drink alcohol and smoke. So estimated that 40% of cancer incidence in men is associated with diet, 60% of cancer incidence in women is associated with diet. So we do have some say in, in, in some of this. Um, so some lifestyle recommendations. High fat diets are not recommended, particularly high fat, high saturated fat. Those ones that we're trying to avoid for heart health anyway are the ones we really want to cut out the most. Maintain a healthy weight. Um, avoid being underweight or overweight and limit your weight gain during adulthood to less than 11 pounds. That's been said to be um, effective. Um, stay active, limit alcohol, um, particularly if women have, are worried about breast cancer. Um, we've seen a high correlation between drinking more than one drink per day of alcohol and incidence of breast cancer. Here's the interesting thing about that, right? Say I don't drink Monday through Thursday. 
four days. So I'm like, well, one, two, four days? I didn't have a drink. I can have those on Friday. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. That's that up, still ups your risk. So don't think of it on average. Think of it anytime you have alcohol, one drink a day is what's recommended for women, two for men if they're going to drink. So um, at the end of this presentation, there's actually some serving sizes, five ounces of wine, a 12-ounce beer, a shot of uh, 80 proof liquor, that type of thing. Don't smoke, eat a variety of healthy foods with emphasis on plant sources. If someone said to me, I am the most motivated person on the world in the world, tell me the healthiest diet to follow, I'm gonna probably put them vegan, okay? I'm vegetarian, not vegan, because vegan's a little too hard for me to do. Um, there's no cancer incidence in my family. I'm hoping that maybe I don't need to get, but, but anyway, it is. We know the China study has looked at several different um, areas of the world. We know that vegetarian is the healthiest way to go, but it's not all really the most doable for everybody. So, um, but the plant sources, as many plant sources as you can get into your diet. Limit consumption of red meats because it's been highly correlated with cardiovascular disease and um, also cancer. Five or more servings of fruits and veggies a day. Work on just getting those intakes up. Do not eat charred food. A lot of people haven't heard about this. That's a carcinogen. I used to like that blackened when I did eat meat, that blackened part of the chicken or, or whatever. That's actually carcinogenic, so you really don't want to be doing that. Limit how much you eat meat that is actually broiled in a direct flame. Keep screening for cancer. Communicate with your physician. Let them know when anything changes. Um, I can hang around to finish a little bit, um, but if anybody needs to get back to work, please don't worry about getting up and leaving because um, I am running a little late on my presentation. Um, antioxidants, what are they? They are compounds that prevent or repair damage to cells, right, that are caused by pollution, sunlight, normal body processes. They scavenge and destroy those free radicals we were talking about that cause those genetic variances um, on your DNA. They block chemical reactions. And that destroy free radicals in the first place and destroy ones that are already formed. So you've got lists of cancer-fighting foods here. Yellow, orange fruits and vegetables, cruciferous vegetables like radish, broccoli, cauliflower. Tomatoes, that lycopene works the same way um, with cancer prevention. Grapes, those, that dark um, kind of purple flavonoid, um, those are really high in antioxidants. Vitamin D, actually. Interestingly, what they have also found, you know, we make vitamin D when we go into the sunlight. Actually, our skin um, can help, help um, convert sunlight into vitamin D. What we found is that women who live in parts of the world that don't have much sunlight have higher rates of breast cancer. They have linked vitamin, low levels of vitamin D to lots of different diseases, but um, cancer is one of them. We don't get it much through our food supply, but you will find it in fortified milk and egg yolks. Omega-3 fatty acids, we've seen that with um, cancer prevention as well. So again, the fish and the flaxseed that we talked about. The interesting thing about flaxseed is in some of the studies, they've actually used it in some studies to shrink the size of breast cancer before they go in and actually excise the rest of it out. So we believe it's really, um, really powerful for that. A lot of the studies on foods and cancer, you'll see it associated a lot with breast cancer because there's a lot of money behind breast cancer research, but we think it's applicable to other, um, uh, other uh, types of cancer as well. Remember that peel and the white membrane in the oranges, that's great. Um, that's gonna be cancer preventive also. Dietary fiber um, in your grains. That's why I don't like to see people go completely, totally grain free is because usually they're not getting in a lot of the beneficial fibers. Green tea have a lot of polyphenols. Caffeinated green tea has twice as much antioxidants as decaffeinated. Okay, hundred times the antioxidant power of vitamin, hundred times the antioxidant power of vitamin C. Green, that's what green tea has. So green tea is great for you. We think black tea is as well. Olive oil has some um, phytochemicals and antioxidants in it, as well as vitamin E. They're doing some studies with dark cherries. There's a compound in it that have been, has been inhibiting mammary cancer in rats. Garlic, um, the sulfur compound, that really pungent taste and smell, um, is, is, has actually killed cancer in test tubes. And so if you're gonna cook it though, always peel and chop up your garlic and let it sit for 10 minutes so that those compounds can develop. Spinach um, has also been um, linked to decreased rates of breast cancer. Soy, okay, here's what I'm gonna tell you about soy. Soy is entirely, um, 100% a great um, food source to use for, preven for prevention of cancer. Where some controversy exists 
is if, if I already have some sort of cancer developing and I don't know about it and I go and start to do set soy foods heavily, they're worried that that actually can generate, speed up that cancer um, a little bit. And that's why you'll see women who've had breast cancer, doctors will tell them to avoid soy products. But we're not quite sure about that actually. Um, it's more of a cautionary thing to do, but it is such, um, what basically it mimics um, the structure of estrogen. It's, it, it basically replaces those strong estrogens. Um, it blocks the receptor sites, soy does. And so those estrogen-related cancers can really be prevented by using a lot of soy. Um, so again, tofu um, uh, is a great source of it, and I, I like the edamame and the soy nuts. Nuts and seeds, all of these things right here, copper, ellagic acid, vitamin E, omega-3, these are very potent um, uh, antioxidants. Um, that the capsin and peppers has been also been shown to kill some of the uh, cancer in test tubes. The pectin and apples, always eat the peel. If you can eat the peel of a fruit or a vegetable, try to do it. Wash it really well and try to eat it, the ones that are edible, because a lot of the beneficial um, uh, antioxidants are in the peel or right under the surface of the peel. So when you peel it, you actually peel away some of it. So try to use it when possible. Beans have protease inhibitors, which um, also help with in inhibition of cancer cells. Fava beans are the highest. And of course, we talked about the citrus fruits. Blueberries, oh my goodness. More, they contain more antioxidants than it probably almost than any other fruit or vegetable, I would say, because they keep uh, doing a little bit more research in some of the other berries. What I'll also say is um, the research that links blueberries to the prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's is very, very strong. Used to, we thought when you had the, the death of a brain cell, that's it, it's gone. Nope, blueberries regenerate it. You can actually grow new, new brain cells if you get in. And what they're saying is to try to use half a cup to a cup of blueberries every single day. They think it might extra extrapolate to other berries as well. Um, but the blueberries are the ones that have been studying. It's fascinating stuff. So we did a whole talk on this for something called Neuro Night in Oklahoma City OU Med Center. So, um, so that's something I would, I would recommend for just about anybody. Fresh raw vegetables are more protective than cooked vegetables. If cooking, cook lightly, and that's for the most part. So here's the things I wanna caution and then we're, we're, we're tying up here. Omega-6 fatty acids are found in vegetable, corn oil, soybean oil-based um, mayonnaise, dairy products, things of that nature. We already get so much of it in our diet that we're trying to um, lower it because you know what omega-6 fatty acids do when you get too much? It leads to estrogen production. And so again, those hormone-related cancers um, are affected by that. Trans fatty acids, margarine, french fries, processed foods, um, anything made with hydrogenated fats um, may increase the risk of breast cancer specifically. Red meat and or meat cooked well done um, is something that we also want to limit because of the carcinogenic effect of well done red meat. Um, also, we, there are high, it's highly, highly coordinated, uh, co correlated with colon cancer as well. Nitrates and nitrites, preservatives are, that are used to prevent bacterial overgrowth and all those um, things like bologna, ham, hot dogs, bacon that you buy. Um, also used as a color and flavor enhancer in many foods. Those are strongly linked with stomach and esophageal cancer. Used to be called um, the blue collar workers cancer, basically. They take their bologna sandwich to work every day, and that's one of the reasons that you, we would see such high incidences um, is the processed meats and nitrates in that. So here's that information on alcohol, trying to limit your consumption of alcohol. Um, so as you can see from things that we've talked about today, um, is that Food is powerful in so many different stages of that um, progression of cancer and cardiovascular disease. Um, and we have seen people, I guess probably one of the most notable public figures probably, is um, President Bill Clinton actually reversed cardiovascular disease, reversed it entirely. Now, he follows more of like a vegan type diet, um, but you don't see evidence. Um, and, and there's many other people like that. If they're willing to make some dramatic changes, um, they can actually reverse disease. It's definitely easier to prevent um, and start, start changing those behaviors um, uh, now and into the future. Um, and remember too, um, you know, most women who get breast cancer don't have any family history of it. They don't. Um, so, so used to, I'd think, ah, I probably don't have to worry about that, right? I don't know anybody in my family that, that's had it. 
but yeah, you can you can be at risk for it. I've had friends diagnosed with it, no family family history. Um, we have to think about what we're doing with our sedentary lifestyle, and then what are we getting in? We're missing lots of nutrients. So focus on getting in what you can. Increase those fruits and vegetables and bean consumption, all of those things, and then try to start gradually cutting down on the things that we say um, are, are more of the limit, um, and that that will be really powerful. Okay, I'm sorry I went over this. I, I knew there was going to be a lot of information in this one, but does anybody have any questions? Um, and also, feel free if you need to leave. But if anybody has any questions, I can I can take those now, or I'll hang around up here for a couple minutes. All right. Yes. T and a what? Oh, 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 oh. Um, I don't know because you know. We don't have a study for that one. <laughs> but now I would assume that in the K-cup, it's pretty much, if you open, have you ever opened one of those to look inside of them? Um, it's probably more comparable a little bit to, um, like the ones that I open, those are more like the loose teas kind of. Um, I don't know that it's gonna be as effective as the actual brewed tea because they want you to brew it for three solid minutes to get all those polyphenols. You're probably getting some out of it, you know, you really are. It's just probably not optimum. I would say brewed tea, actual brewed on the stove would probably be the best option. Let it steep for a while. Yes? Um, on, in that book, the China study, um, they did studies on milk consumption. Yes. And said that it was directly linked in their studies to cancer mm. development. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, and there's there's different reasons. There's been some some different theories proposed on that. So it's hard to say. I mean, I think that um, one of the books, by the way, that does a really good um, like lay explanation of many of the things from the China study plus more is the Eat to Live book. Um, and because he does such a wonderful job going through the science of why we recommend that. And he actually is a big proponent of limiting dairy as well, if you can, um, because of um, things like arachidonic acid and th other components that are in it that can be uh, deemed, um, yes, yeah, acidi the acidity. Um, also, you know, they've actually seen, and this is where it's confusing, because we always say drink milk for your good bones. We've actually seen a lot of people with, with um, that had almost excessive milk consumption in their younger years that actually have lower bone density. So who knows, you know, on that. So, um, but just because of what's in milk products, um, a lot of contaminants, if you don't do organic, a lot of times I tell people to try to limit milk consumption. But um, from that particular aspect, yeah, I'm not sure. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming today. I appreciate it. I'll be up here for a couple of minutes if you have it. Well, we might as well wait just a few more minutes and see if anybody else. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'll start by introducing myself. It was, was anybody at the last presentation last month? I thought I recognized some faces, so. Um, a few of you um, were not here, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Um, my name's Kimberly Davis Coniglio. I'm a registered dietitian that's based out of Norman. Um, I've been in private practice for about, I'd say probably about 13 years. Started out as a dietitian at the University of Oklahoma um, on the campus as the campus dietitian and then after a couple of years went into private practice for myself. I currently see clients in office and do a lot of virtual consultations since I have clients in other parts of the state, in other parts of the country, and that's kind of where a lot of, uh, a lot of telemedicine um, and medicine is going is into telemedicine. So today what we're gonna talk about is power foods, prevention and treatment of disease. And what I like to tell people about is how did I become a dietitian? Or why did I decide to become a dietitian? Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. 
I was one of those college kids that switched majors so many times. Um, I was very bright, straight A student. That wasn't the problem, but I guess I was wise enough to realize that whatever I wanted to do as a career, I knew I had to have a passion for it. So I would switch my major and then I'd go get a little job in that area and see what it was really like. Um, for some reason I wanted to be a pharmacist because I thought it was really interesting. And then the day to day I was like, nah, I don't see myself doing that. So I switched my major several times and ended up actually with a, an undergrad degree in psychology because I thought it was really interesting. But in my senior year um, of my undergrad degree, I took a wonderful nutrition course um, taught by Dr. Kneehands at the University of Oklahoma and learned so much in that introductory nutrition course. And I was fascinated by the fact that your nutrition is not just preventative, but good nutrition can actually treat and reverse disease. So I thought that was amazing. And we all grow up knowing the importance of nutrition. You know, drink your milk for strong bones, all those things that you learn, eat your fruits and veggies. But today, what you're going to see, hopefully, as we go through this presentation, is exactly how powerful food is, and specifically um, in the area of cardiovascular disease and in the area of cancer prevention. And, and being able to um, see how powerful that is, I think, gets people motivated. The other thing I like to focus on as a dietitian is focusing on what are good foods to eat. Because you know when you go to your doctor's office, a lot of people will say, well, they kind of handed me a sheet of paper and said follow this diet for whatever condition they might have. And a lot of times that sheet of paper tells you what to limit or what to stop eating, right? And so people are left going, well, what do I eat then? <laughs> so what I have found to be really effective um, with helping create uh, some change in the areas of nutrition is to focus on what can you have? What should you be focusing on adding into your diet? A lot of times that'll push out the stuff that you shouldn't be eating as much of anyway. Um, and then of course, giving you a little bit of information on, on what to limit um, is, is helpful too. So what I did with this presentation, it's actually kind of mushed together a couple of presentations I normally do. One that's called Foods That Fight Cancer, and the other one is Power Foods for Cardiovascular Disease. So you're gonna get um, information on both of those topics today. So what I wanna start with is just talking a little bit about mortality in, in America and the top 10 causes of death. This has actually changed within uh, there's a presentation I used to do for students at OU probably about eight years ago, and um, this has changed uh, quite a bit. Not the number one and number two, but, but where everything falls within the rest of the, the top ten has changed. For instance, Alzheimer's disease used to not be listed as a top ten cause of death, but as you'll see, it's number six now. Um, number one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. Three is chronic lower respiratory disease, things like um, COPD, emphysemia, those lung diseases. Accidents is number four, stroke number five, Alzheimer's number six, seven is diabetes, eight influenza and pneumonia, nine kidney disease, and 10 is suicide. And eight out of the 10 causes are nutrition or lifestyle related. So of course we can take off accidents and suicide for nutrition and re um, directly being nutrition um, related or lifestyle re related. Um, some people ask, well, how's influenza and pneumonia nutrition related? Many people who end up in the hospital with influenza and pneumonia are already undernourished. Um, sometimes you'll see elderly that are undernourished, underweight, um, and that actually is what leads to their mortality rate um, with influ influenza and pneumonia. Some of these other ones definitely make sense, heart disease, cancer, stroke, which we'll talk about, Alzheimer's disease, that's a, a big area of study right now. Um, it's some, some of what we're seeing is leading us to believe it's kind of like inflammation in the brain, diabetes of the brain, in a sense. Um, so there's a lot of studies going on about what can, what can help with prevention in those areas. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about statistics. In 2011, we found that 52% of adults did not meet recommendations for aerobic exercise, which the recommendations that we're looking at is to exercise at least 150 minutes per week. And then 76% did not meet the recommendations for muscle and strength exercise as well. 47% of adults had at least one major risk factor 
for heart disease and stroke, so either uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled LDL, which is your bad cholesterol levels, or they were a current smoker. And 90% of Americans consume too much sodium, which can be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease in some people. And then, of course, we can't forget to look a little bit at just the weight, um, obesity and overweight epidemic in America. So 71% of Americans are overweight, and 38% of Americans are not only overweight, but they also fall into the classification of obesity. And if you're wondering where that, what, what classifies you as overweight or obese, what the medical profession uses is the, the BMI scale. Um, and so a BMI of 25 to 29.9 indicates someone um, is overweight. A BMI of 30 and over is obese. I will tell you, dietitians don't love the BMI. Um, it's body mass index. It's basically a comparison of your height to your weight. It doesn't take into consideration muscle mass, how much of your weight's muscle versus fat. So, so if we can get more information on that, that's what we like to do, is do um, some body fat testing. Um, a lot of men actually come up overweight uh, because they have a lot of muscle mass on them. And so when we do uh, some body fat testing, sometimes we find that they're not overweight. However, the BMI was designed, um, that tool was designed for, to look at the average American. And it works pretty well for the average American. Oklahoma is one of the nine states with the highest prevalence of obesity. Something that is really important to look at is waist circumference. And I focus on this a lot in initial sessions with clients. On average, um, the American man has a waist circumference that's almost about 40 inches, and for American women, 37 and a half. So why is that concerning? Because a waist circumference above 35 for women and above 40 for men indicates what we call abdominal obesity. So actually, someone can be a normal BMI, but have a, a abdominal obesity. Maybe that's, you know, it's kind of like a body type. Some people put on weight in the middle. And this will place one at a higher risk for heart disease and type 2 diabetes. So weight loss is recommended um, in general for, for lots of health conditions, but also prevention of health conditions. Um, many times you will find that weight loss, um, even a 10% weight loss, will help somebody normalize their blood pressure issues. They'll start to see better control of their blood sugar numbers. Um, so it's always a good goal to start with a 10% weight loss if someone is overweight, and then modify that goal as time goes on. One to two pounds per week is a good rate of weight loss. Why? Because we want it coming from body fat. We don't want you breaking down muscle mass. And if you lose weight too fast, more than two pounds a week, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're breaking down some muscle mass, which we do not want to do because that's your major determinant of your metabolic rate, okay? So, and also what I found with clients is one to two pounds per week is pretty doable for them. And most people, if they're gonna focus on one area, either nutrition or physical activity, they can do one pound per week. If they focus on both pretty hardcore, they can usually um, lose the two pounds a week of body fat. Also, physical activity, it contributes to weight loss, it decreases abdominal fat, increases cardiorespiratory fitness, helps maintain that weight loss, which is really important. And in the last presentation that I did last month, I kind of focused on that. It's not just about losing the weight, it's about maintaining that weight loss, right? Because we all know how to lose weight. And again, 96% of Americans who lose weight regain that weight. Um, and so what we want to do is focus on, well, how do we pull it off and keep it off? And one of the things I tell clients is, if you're not willing to get physically active, you might be able to go ahead and lose weight through nutritional changes, but I doubt you'll be able to keep that weight off. Physical activity is very important for keeping the weight off. Initially, um, starting out at 30 to 45 minutes of cardiovascular activity three to five days per week, but really trying to get people where they're doing at least 30 minutes a day. And the good news is it can be something as simple as brisk walking. That's very, very helpful. Some additional risk factors that we look at outside of just weight um, is high blood pressure, like hypertension, high LDL cholesterol, which is considered your bad cholesterol, Low HDL cholesterol, which is considered your good cholesterol. So what I always like to explain is that 
Your bad cholesterol is the one that if the levels are too high, it can cause plaque buildup on the inside of your arteries, but the good cholesterol is the one that tries to clean it up, right? And that's why you wanna have good numbers on both sides of that. High triglycerides, which is a circulating fat in our bloodstream, high blood glucose, family history of premature heart disease, um, so someone who maybe has a parent that um, developed heart disease in their 30s or 40s or even 50s can be considered premature. Physical inactivity is a risk factor um, for bad health and also, of course, cigarette smoking. So what I'm going to focus on first <clears throat> is, in general, just cardiovascular disease. Now, what you're going to find when I start talking about specific foods is that you'll see some foods that are really good for um, prevention of cardiovascular disease and also are going to be on the prevention of cancer list, too. So, so high blood pressure. Nearly one in three, S, uh, three U.S. adults have hypertension, but only a third are aware of it. So in the medical community, we always call this the silent killer because there's so many people walking around with high blood pressure. And they don't feel the symptoms. They have no clue. Maybe they're not going to their regular doctor visits. Um, it's the single most important risk factor for stroke. Um, and stroke, again, is the number five cause of death among Americans. The cause is unknown in about 90 to 95 percent of cases, but we do know what helps control it or reverse it. And that, for the most part, it's weight loss. Almost every client that comes in with high blood pressure, one of the things we're going to focus on is getting some weight off because that seems to help it drastically. It either reverses it entirely or it, it helps manage it. Um, and one of the things, why is high blood pressure a problem? Well, think about um, your arteries, when they're, when they're wide and open and blood circulates through easily, that's great. When for some reason those, those arteries are either getting occluded or narrowing, that means that the blood is increasing pressure, trying to go through a smaller space, right? And that's where you'll start to see damage to vessels that are going to your brain, to your heart, and to your kidneys. Um, so basically, those organs aren't getting the oxygen they need, and that's what causes some of the problems that you'll see with kidney disease. Um, high blood pressure is very much linked to dementia, um, the one of the causes of dementia. It, it can damage the, the vascular areas of your brain. Um, and then, of course, it can damage your heart. Now, atherosclerosis, this is the process of where those fatty substances, cholesterol, cellular waste products, calcium, and fibrin build up in the inner lining of your artery. And usually this can be caused by high cholesterol levels. Another thing um, is cigarette smoking. Anything that comes in that goes through your bloodstream and causes little lesions to form on the inside of your arteries. So let's just take cigarette smoking as an example. So the chemicals in cigarette smoking in your blood go through your artery and cause these little lesions to form, you know, little nicks on the inside of your arteries. So that's a place that when that cholesterol comes through, it has a place to grab onto, is that little lesion. And so it'll start sticking there. And that's why cigarette smoking is highly um, correlated with atherosclerosis. Approximately 107 million American adults have total blood cholesterol levels above what is considered desirable. One of the things, though, that we are focusing more on as a medical community is not really just total cholesterol. Um, and I don't like when I see physicians run a total number, but they don't run the LD on the HDL, um, because you can have a, a high total and still have decent LDL and HDL numbers. Um, and, and if your HDL is high, um, that can be, for the most part, unless it's just drastically high, it's a good thing, right? Um, so we always want to make sure that you're getting your LDL and HDL looked at. And really, they're going a little bit further than that now. Some physicians, there's additional testing on um, the density of the particles. Um, so do you have small, um, really dense LDL, or do you have big... Um, less dense LDL because we know the smaller dense ones cause more damage. Um, there's some genetic testing that's going along with heart disease um, as well, and so we're finding um, that more tests are available to calculate your risk. So let's look at some of the power foods, prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Some of you may have heard the term functional foods. That term's been around for a while. Um, these are foods that provide a health benefit beyond just the simple nutrients that they provide. So in other words, beyond the fact that this is high in vitamin C or beyond the fact that this um, 
is a, a good protein source. Maybe it lowers cholesterol levels, lowers blood pressure, um, something of that nature. Supplementation with individual components of food that are found in functional foods is not nearly as powerful as consuming them through food sources. So what I always try to emphasize is that there are hundreds of phytochemicals in fruits and vegetables. And so when you just focus on isolating one of them and putting them in a pill form, you're not gonna, it's not gonna be as effective as getting it through the food form because they all work synergistically together to, to um, enhance your health. So let's look at some specific ones. Beans are really at the top of the list. You know, when we talk about fruits and vegetables, we really like to include beans in this because they are really, really good for health. Men and women who ate beans at least four times per week in studies had a 22% lower risk of coronary heart disease compared with those who consumed beans less than once a week. And those who ate the beans most frequently had lower blood pressure and total cholesterol. So what is it about beans? Well, for one thing, there is a particular type of fiber called soluble fiber that beans are really high in. And just so you know, let me, let me explain the two different fibers. You've got insoluble fiber and soluble fiber. So insoluble fiber is the type of fiber that you think of when you think of like wheat bran cereal, um, something that's really dense and kind of feels kind of woody. It actually um, moves things through your colon. So it's, we call it nature's broom. It kind of sweeps everything through, which is good. Soluble fiber is different. It actually so it forms a gel inside your colon, so it's kind of softer, and, and it actually binds cholesterol in your intestines, and so that's going to decrease your circulating cholesterol. Clinical studies have shown that um, cholesterol levels drop between 0.5 and 2% for every gram of soluble fiber eaten per day. So when you see those commercials that are related to Cheerios, oatmeal, they're talking about the soluble fiber that's in that. Um, consumption of just half a cup of beans each day is just as effective as oat bran in lowering blood cholesterol levels. But for some reason, we don't see those commercials. Um, but beans, and of course, beans do have that bad side effect for some people. Um, also, some evidence that soluble fiber can slow the liver's manufacture of cholesterol, as well as later um, low-density lipoprotein product, particles to make them larger and less dense, so that's great. The other thing about beans is that it's high in folate. And folate plays a critical role in the reduction of homocysteine levels. I don't know if any of you have heard of homocysteine levels. Sometimes your doctors will focus on that and test for that. And homocysteine is an amino acid byproduct from protein metabolism. And if homocysteine levels are high, they've actually seen that that is a separate um, risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We, don't, we do not want homocysteine levels to be high. So folate plays a critical role in the reduction of your homocysteine levels. High levels of homocysteine are found in um, 20 to 40 percent of patients with coronary artery disease. And of course, the genetic studies are looking at genetics and, and are there certain genetic types that are just more at risk for having higher homocysteine levels? And, and what do we do about that? Just one cup of cooked garbanzo beans provides 70 percent of your daily requirement of folate. The other thing about beans is that they're very high in potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And this is a mineral and electrolyte combination that's associated with reduced risk of heart disease and hypertension. What I'll talk about here in just a little bit is something called the DASH diet, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And what it focuses on is really these combinations of minerals and electrolytes. And it's so effective. It's one of the most underrated diets. Do you know why? Because it's free. It's not a book. Nobody wrote a book to try to sell it to you. Um, it's a free diet that can lower your, um, the top number of your blood pressure by 10 to 12 points. I always make sure if someone comes to me with high blood, pre high blood pressure, in addition to weight loss if needed, we focus immediately on the DASH diet so that they can see immediate results with that. Um, and some people get off their medications. So tips for consumption and preparation of beans. Put canned beans in a strainer and rinse them with cool water, and that's going to eliminate about 40% of the sodium that's in canned beans. Um, the reason why we talk about canned beans is because they're easy, right? And so there's a lot of nutrition information that we give, but we have to try to simplify it as much as possible for people. Um, people know that it's best to, well, let me get the dry beans and cook them up, cook up a pot of beans, right? I'm sure that's healthier than canned, but is someone actually going to do that or, or make the time to do that? So we do still say, well, canned beans are good. You can actually find lower sodium versions available now, which is good, but you can also rinse those off and get rid of a lot of the sodium. Make hummus. 
Um, you can take garbanzo beans or really any other canned beans that you like and then just um, mix it up with chopped garlic and olive oil and just puree it in your food processor. Prepare bean salads. Toss different varieties together with fresh herbs and olive oil. Combine beans with pasta. And that sounds strange, but I've come across a lot of really good recipes um, that combine those two. So beans are great. If you have a problem with the side effects of beans, um, there's a couple of things I sometimes look at. Um, a lot of clients have some sort of, I think, kind of undiagnosed issues with their gut, um, sometimes that are related to the bacteria in our gut, the good versus bad. So I've actually seen when we put people on really good quality probiotics that some of the side effects that they would have with like lactose intolerance, like milk, um, and sometimes things with beans or excess gas production gets much, much better once they regulate that good versus bad bacteria. So that's one thing I do. And then, of course, they do have um, some products that, that people can take along with the food um, to help relieve um, the production of gas. So fish. Two to three servings of fish weekly is good for you. The average North American consumes just one serving a week, which is kind of surprising because I wouldn't have th thought it was that high. When I talk to clients, a lot of times they're not consuming any fish at all, um, but that's what the studies have shown. There's some compelling evidence that fish can reduce blood cholesterol levels. Um, consuming just six ounces per week of fatty fish may be enough to reduce the risk of dying from heart disease by 36 percent. In one large trial, by consuming one gram per day, which would be equivalent to two to three six ounce servings of uh, fatty fish per week, um, that gave enough omega-3 fatty acids over a three and a half year period that individuals who had survived a heart attack could lower their risk of dying from heart disease. So these people in the studies, they had already had a heart attack before they introduced this protocol, and then um, they lowered their risk of dying from heart disease by 25%. There is con some conflicting information about fish and fish oil out there, and um, I was just talking about this earlier, earlier to Laura that what we're seeing is there is a lot of studies going on with genetics, right? And so you know how you'll see studies where it'll say, oh, this compelling evidence, look how, how beneficial fish oil is for, say, lowering triglyceride levels or something. And then you'll see some other study that comes out and goes, eh, nah, we didn't get that result. Well, a lot of it comes down to the genetics of the participants that are in those studies. So I always like to use the example, why are eggs okay to eat now? You know, used to we would say, oh, limit your consumption to one or two eggs a week. And that's because there were some studies that, would, that showed that if you ate more than two eggs a week, cholesterol levels seemed to go up. But you know, it's a very small subset of our population that that occurs in, and there's a genetic variant there that causes that. So now we're like, well, for the vast majority of people, eggs are okay. So um, medicine and nutritional recommendations as time goes on will be very individualized to the person right now. Um, there's an area called functional medicine, functional nutrition, where they'll look at, from what we know right now, genetics and, and creating some individualized guidelines for you. As research continues with genetics, we're gonna see that expand greatly. So with fish, what are some of the beneficial components? Well, of course, the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, one of the, the biggest things about fish is that it lowers the risk of heartbeat abnormalities that may result in a sudden heart attack or death. So some people just have a condition where the, the um, electrical activity of their heart is, is a little abnormal. Maybe their cholesterol levels are fine. Maybe they're not getting any, any kind of information that anything's a little wacky, and that might not even be something that they can feel, that electrical abnormality. Um, and that's why sometimes you'll find someone that had a sudden heart attack, um, and it was completely just off the radar, and it might have been due to uh, electrical activity problem. So we know omega-3 fatty acids lowers the risk of that. Um, it prolongs life after a heart attack by improving heart function and reducing damage from heart disease. It modestly lowers blood pressure, thereby reducing risk of heart attack and stroke. And it also acts as an anti-inflammatory, preventing blood vessels from becoming inflamed. So there's a lot of good reasons to get in some omega-3 fatty acids. It can reduce triglyceride levels and reduce the formation of atherosclerotic plaque on arteries by increasing HDL and reducing LDL. And I'll say this. I've seen that benefit in some clients and not in others. So again, I think we, we believe that there is a, a genetic reason for that. 99% of Americans do not consume enough. Um, it's probably one of the 
um, things that I'll focus on the most, especially when I'm looking at food records and analyzing people's diets, is how much omega-3s are actually coming in. Because the ratio that we want, omega-6 fatty acids versus omega-3 is one to one, while America's ratio is 14 to one to 25 to one, which is vastly out of balance, okay? So omega-6 fatty acids, we get that through a lot of processed foods and a lot of different types of oils. Um, it's just an abundant supply. Um, and we do need some omega-6, we just go vastly beyond what we do need. And we need to uh, increase our, in our consumption of omega-3 fatty acids. <clears throat> so what about consuming fish oil capsules? So particularly, if you can eat fish, we want you to get, we always want you to go to the food. So if you like fish and you can increase your consumption of fish, that's what we would like for you to do. Some people really do not like fish. They, they can't eat it. So what we'll have them do is buy some um, fish oil capsules, but only if it says distilled or molecularly distilled on that fish oil capsule, because we don't want you getting in any contaminants like mercury um, or PCBs that might be um, uh, in some of the concentrated fish oil um, capsules. One of the ones I recommend a lot is just the over-the-counter over Mega Red. It's krill oil. Um, there is some concern about contaminants in fish. Um, particularly mercury and PCBs. Um, what we found is for, for most people, the pros and cons of that, right? Because fish can, ha it can be a source of mercury. Um, as long as you're not eating vast amounts of fish, we feel like the benefits are going to, to definitely outweigh the cons of eating fish. But we do focus on a few groups like pregnant women, nursing women, and young children. Um, trying to make sure that they don't uh, necessarily eat more than about two or three servings of fatty fish per week because we feel like the levels of mercury might be a little high after that. Can excessive intake of omega-3 um, fatty acids be dangerous? It can be. Omega-3 fatty acids are a blood thinner, basically. So you can thin your blood out too much. So you always want to look at what are the recommendations, how much should I be taking, which we'll talk about if you're going to take fish oil. Um, and so if you thin out your blood too much, you can, you can actually um, put yourself at risk of a hemorrhagic stroke, so kind of a bleeding out. Um, and so particularly if people are on blood thinners or say they take an aspirin every day because their doctor told them to, or they're on a, um, a more something like warfarin, which is more of a prescription blood thinner, Definitely don't take anything like this unless you talk to your doctor first, because if they want you to take that, they'll give you a, a, a better idea of what the dosage should be. Um, we do believe that excessive amounts of omega-3 fatty acids can adversely affect your immune system. We've seen some studies with that, and so we're talking about mega doses of omega-3 fatty acids. So again, it's really important to look at what the, the dosage recommendations are. Okay, so the target amount um, of EPA or DHA, which are, are omega-3 fatty acids, is 1.6 grams per day for men and 1.1 per day for women. So what if I just wanna get that through my food sources? Here's a list of some food sources right there for you. So you can see that um, some of the salmon will have one gram, one and a half grams. There's sardines, um, canned white tuna. The other thing is, um, one tablespoon of ground flaxseed has about one gram. Um, it's a different type of omega-3 fatty acid. It's called ALA. And um, it's, it's more of a plant source of an omega-3 fatty acid. Um, it's good for you. I try to, I try to get clients to get both in, um, a fish type source and then also a source that's from um, plant sources. Due to the potential mercury content of canned tuna, um, some of the recommendations really point to that you should really um, not eat more than about one six ounce can of tuna per week and try to buy al albacore. It's the richest tuna source of omega-3 fatty acids. Where we see concern with this type of thing is when people just get into their monotonous diet, right? And um, I see that more with men than women. Men, no, women just like their variety. <laughs> but men can be can really seem to eat the same thing every single day, um, and that's where something like that could be concerning, right? Oh, I hear it's a great protein source, great omega three fatty acids. I'll just throw in a six ounce can every day. And so what we want to do is try to try to get multiple sources, um, uh, different food sources going on there. So with the flax seed that I talked about. Um, flax seed is uh, slightly larger than sesame seeds. It's darker in color and very shiny. 
you know, maybe five years ago, if I talked about flaxseed, a lot of people wouldn't know what I was talking about. Today, a lot of people know what, what we're talking about. Some of the beneficial components, again, is over the half the fat in flax comes from omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. It's a good source of soluble and insoluble fiber. Um, and the ALA that I was talking about is the omega-3 fatty acid that offers protective effects against coronary heart disease and stroke, and it also protects against hypertension. So there's different ways to consume flaxseed. Um, and what seems to be the therapeutic dosage is three teaspoons to three tablespoons a day. Sprinkle it on cereals, into yogurt, on salads, um, put it into smoothies. Uh, you can put it on just about anything. Um, also, they do make uh, flaxseed oil, um, which you always want to refrigerate after opening. And you can use that sparingly in homemade salad dressings um, and then also in smoothies. Just be aware that it's not going to have um, all of the components because it's an oil. So a lot of those fibers have been removed. And so using ground flaxseed is a, is a great choice. Use ground flaxseed in muffins, breads, pancakes. Um, it basically adds kind of like a nutty flavor to foods. I always say either purchase it already ground up, ground flaxseed, um, or you can food process your own if you want to. If you have a little food, uh, coffee grinder that you want to um, use just for grinding up the flaxseed, because they're so small that they go through undigested, basically. Our body has a hard time breaking that down unless you've actually milled it and ground it up. So walnuts, um, the FDA has recognized actually the cholesterol lowering property, uh, properties of walnuts and it's also beneficial in reducing the risk of heart disease and inflammation and that is due to high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids, particularly that ALA, which is the plant source, and then also phytosterols and phytosterols are compound, compounds that also appear to lower total cholesterol levels. So it looks like you only need to consume a handful of walnuts a day to receive the cholesterol lowering benefits. The FDA, this is, a, this is a statement they've put out. Supportive but not conclusive research shows that one and a half ounces of walnuts per day is part of a low saturated fat, low cholesterol diet and not resulting in an increased caloric intake may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. So nuts have a lot of calories in them, right? So that's why you wanna watch your, one of the reasons you wanna watch your portion size. Walnuts contain the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids in one ounce, which is usually about a handful in comparison to other nuts. Um, so as you see, 2.5 grams versus less than 0.5 in other nuts. Um, we've probably all heard about the Framingham uh, Nurses Health Study, um, where they've collected lots and lots of information. Um, they found that drinking one daily glass of orange juice reduces the risk of stroke by 25%. Many other studies have confirmed similar benefits from regular consumption of citrus fruit, okay? A human clinical trial showed that orange juice was shown to elevate your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, while lowering your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol. And citrus seems to have a protective ability against that stroke. One glass daily lowers your risk by 25% in healthy men, compared with 11% um, from juices that are, that are made from other um, fruits. So why might that be? There's some beneficial components. Of course, we all know vitamin C, right? And orange juice is the primary source of vitamin C in our diets. And it's a very powerful antioxidant. Oranges also have something called flavonoids. And these are um, powerful antioxidants. Citrus flavonoids are found in the fruit's tissue. So it's, it's in their tissue, the juice, the pulp, and the skin. So it's pretty much found everywhere. Therefore, the whole fruit is going to be much better to eat than actually to drink the juice. Um, intake is inversely associated with the incident of heart attack and stroke. Um, hesperidin is one flavonoid that we find in citrus that works to revive vitamin C after it's been quenched to free radicals. So we'll be talking a little bit more about free radicals, but basically what they are is we have a lot of processes that go on in our body that um, produce oxidation. Um, and when we go exercise, which is really good for us, oxidation occurs. And we want to have antioxidants that help um, bring that oxidation level down. Free radicals are produced during oxidation, and what they do is that's where they go to your cells and create some of the, gen the, the DNA damage that can eventually lead to cancer. Um, so once vitamin C is used, to clean up some of those free radicals, hesperidin from oranges helps revive it so, so it can 
be useful again, that vitamin C. Why is that important? Because vitamin C is something that's water soluble. We have to get it in on a daily basis. Our body doesn't make it at all, so we have to have it. So if we can um, replenish that supply, that's always good. Um, pectin is the dietary fiber that's found in oranges, and that's very effective at lowering cholesterol levels. It's present in large amounts in the white lining of citrus fruits. And then there's folate. Again, we talked about that. It's a B vitamin that plays an important role in lowering blood concentrations of that homocysteine. And folate works with other B vitamins like B12 and B6 to remove that homocysteine from our circulatory system. What we're, what we're finding with some of the genetic testing is that, particularly with B vitamins, we're seeing some variance in genetic testing um, that affects people's ability to use B vitamins um, well, and so that's an area of research right now. And there's evidence that increased folate intake can actually improve heart health in people who've already developed heart disease. Now, are vitamin C supplements helpful? Well, your body doesn't really know the difference between the vitamin C that comes in through food versus the ascorbic acid that's in, in the vitamin C pills. Um, but the problem is that there's the polyphenols. Remember how I said there's all kinds of antioxidants that are actually in the whole food um, that work together to prevent disease. So what we find is that actually getting that vitamin C from your food source, um, the polyphenols that are in that food source actually magnify the ability of that food to work for you. Um, so some tips for consumption. Citrus fruit will not ripen after picking, so be aware of that. The heavier and smaller the fruit and the thinner the skin, the more juice it contains. Eight ounce of orange juice contains about 80 to 140 milligrams of vitamin C, just so that you know your daily requirement somewhere around 90, okay? So you see eight ounces of orange juice, you get your vitamin C in just like that. I get a little concerned if people take massive amounts of vitamin C um, for a couple of reasons. One, it puts you at risk for kidney stones because your body it just becomes very acidic and, and filters through your kidneys um, and you can develop some kidney stones. Um, the other thing too is when you inundate your cells with one major antioxidant, it pushes out room for others to act on the same cells. So that's one of the reasons we don't want drastically high amounts of, of vitamin C coming in. Orange juice stays fresh for two to four weeks after opening, and if you want to revitalize it, you can actually squeeze a lemon into your orange juice container if it's been sitting there for, say, two weeks, and you want to just make it a little bit, um, the vitamin C to kind of refresh a little bit. And then also citrus marmalade can be a good choice, uh, vitamin C as well. Eat an orange, tangerine, or a clementine daily. <clears throat> Some people add them into their smoothies. Um, add orange segments to a spinach salad. Sprinkle grapefruit halves with brown sugar and broil it for a dessert. Add orange juice to your fruit smoothie, or again, orange segments. Um, keep some orange and or lemon zest. And if you don't know what zest is, it's when you um, just kind of grate the outer layer of your fruit. Um, and, put, and then you can put that into cakes and cookies. So we do believe so much in the effect of oranges that we say, eat something citrus like that once a day. That would be great if you can do that. Some beneficial components of spinach um, is there is a compound called betaine, which plays a role, again, in that homocysteine metabolism that we've been talking about, and also carotenoids. Um, when we think of carotenoids, we think, like beta carotene, you think of carrots usually, right? It's really orange. There's just so much chlorophyll in spinach that it masks the color of the beta carotene that's in it, but it's actually really high in carotenoids. And this helps protect your artery walls from damage. Half a cup of cooked spinach contains more than the RDA for beta carotene than you would need. So I, I get a little debate, you know, in debates with people who feel like you can't get your nutrients from your food because you start looking at these small amounts that you have to have out of different food sources and you definitely can meet your nutritional requirements. Beta carotene converts into vitamin A and then it works with vitamin C um, to prevent oxidized cholesterol from building up in your blood vessel walls. Now, one cup of fresh spinach, like fresh spinach leaves, contains substantial vitamin A and about 11% of your RDA of um, vitamin C. It's very high, spinach is very high in what we call those antihypertensive nutrients. So it helps with blood pressure, high in potassium, calcium, magnesium, folate, polyphenols, fiber, and a trace amount of measurable omega-3 fatty acids is actually found in spinach as well. And of course, it's low in sodium, high in folate. 
So spinach is great. You see a lot of spinach around because there's a smoothie revolution, right? Everybody's doing their smoothies. Um, some tips for consumption, it's sold both loose and in bags. The bagged greens, and I think we've all noticed this, they can deteriorate very quickly after you open them. So they're only going to usually keep three to four days after purchase. Also, your spinach should always smell sweet and the leaves should be crisp and intact. Don't wash before storing, otherwise it's going to deteriorate faster. And then wrap loose spinach in paper towels and store in your crisper. That's the best way to store it um, for longevity. You have to realize, too, that we have no idea how long um, that food has been sitting in the supermarket, right? Um, and then we take it home, and sometimes we may not get to it for a couple of days. Um, and so it goes down in nutrient quality day by day. So the, the fresher you can use, the, the best. Um, also, that's where we sometimes kind of send you to using some of the frozen vegetables because they're frozen at harvest. They have a high nutrient quality. You just have to make sure you're not overcooking them. Um, uh, just try to kind of warm them up, keep them still kind of slightly crispy, just slightly cooked through and, and it'll retain um, more vitamins that way. So wash before serving, don't soak instead. Um, dip, swish, and rinse. Have you ever soaked spinach and then you see the water turns green? A lot of those vitamins just went into the water and you're gonna lose them. So just try to kind of um, dip it, swish, and rinse. Cooking actually liberates the carotenoids and makes them more available. So that's why cooked spinach or even throwing it into um, just like your stir fries and things of that nature is good. It also boosts lutein, which is good for eyesight, but Heat degrades vitamin C and folate, so try to use both forms uh, if you can. Have some cooked spinach, have some fresh spinach. Um, you can layer in a lasagna. Steam and serve, sprinkled with fresh lemon juice and grated Parmesan cheese. Add a handful to your soups. Um, dress with balsamic vinegar dressing and sprinkle with sesame seeds. Add to an omelet. Shred into tacos and burritos. Um, when you have kids, a lot of times you find yourself hiding that stuff in little places and they never notice the difference. Um, now, remember how I talked about the DASH diet? Dietary approaches to stop hypertension. I get actually mad when someone gets referred to me for high blood pressure, and maybe they've been on medication for a year or two already, and no one has ever talked to them about their diet, um, particularly the DASH diet, because it's so effective at lowering blood pressure. Um, as an intern, when I was in school, we all um, would try different things, um, and one of the things that we tried is, well, let's follow the DASH diet for a little bit, make sure that we're getting in all these components that we're talking about. And even though my blood pressure was normal, mine still lowered, actually, following the DASH diet. Um, so what is the crux of the DASH diet? Now, you'll find um, some people have taken it upon themselves to write, like, recipe books and things of that nature that kind of give you some ideas of how to use the DASH diet. It's a free diet. You can go on uh, the Internet and just Google DASH diet, and you're going to have everything, all, a bunch of information will come up about this DASH diet. So basically, um, the crux of it is to get in at least four fruit servings, at least four vegetable servings, and two to three low-fat dairy servings a day. This is the crux of it. This is the foundation, those three products right there. Um, they work together to lower blood pressure. And in the initial studies, they wondered if fruits and vegetables and maybe calcium supplements might do the trick. So they tried that, did not work. So we know that it's a synergistic effect of what's in your fruit and your vegetables and the dairy servings that are working together. So even if somebody wasn't following the rest of the recommendation, like seven to eight grain servings, uh, up to three ounces of servings of lean meat, maybe they're not getting in the nuts and the seeds and the beans per week that's also recommended. If they just focus on getting at least four, the four, four, and, and two to three of the dairy, um, that will lower blood pressure right there. So it sounds like a lot, right? But do you know what a fruit serving is? A fruit serving is just a piece of fruit, right? It's also considered to be six ounces of juice. So if you put that in your smoothie, that's a fruit serving. A fourth a cup of dried fruit, you can use dried fruit um, for the DASH diet, um, is considered a fruit serving. Uh, a cup of diced, like melon, would be a fruit serving. The vegetable servings, though, half a cup of cooked vegetables is one serving. So when we eat cooked vegetables, typically what you'll see is people will usually eat closer, a little bit closer to a cup of cooked vegetables. So say you have a cup of cooked vegetables at lunch and a cup at dinner, you just met your requirement right there for the vegetable servings. If you don't eat cooked vegetables and you eat more like salad, it takes two cups of the salad to equal one um, vegetable serving. And then for your dairy servings, it's basically a cup of milk or a cup of yogurt or one ounce of, of a lower fat cheese, OK? 
okay? So um, I can't emphasize how effective this is. Um, and again, 10 to 12 points of lowering of blood pressure is seen with that. And so um, big believer in this one. Um, and then the rest of the recommendations that are added to this um, are because these components have some of the same um, uh, minerals in them that we're, that we're finding that work synergistically. So like nuts and seeds and beans, if you can add that in on a weekly basis, that helps even more. Um, okay, so tea. Now there's solid evidence that tea consumption is associated with lowered heart disease risk and stroke risk. So what we found is that tea drinkers had only two thirds of, as much coronary artery damage and only one third as much cerebral, so brain artery damage, um, than coffee drinkers. Male deaths from coronary artery disease were reduced by 40% among those who drank one or more cups of tea daily. And then a Harvard study showed that there was a 44% lower risk of heart attack in people who drank at least one cup daily. Um, there's a definitive inverse relationship between tea consumption and what we call those homocysteine levels again. And it plays a role in keeping the lining of your blood vessels plaque free. One study showed that tea consumption in the year before a heart attack is associated with a lower mortality following the heart attack, and in those studies, it was approximately two cups a day. What we know that's in tea that's very beneficial is something called catechins. Um, animal studies show that they, these catechins lower your cholesterol levels, especially your bad cholesterol. And then you've got the antioxidants. Green and black tea both have been shown to be more effective against a common free radical than all of the vegetables tested. Um, one study, actually, there's an African village where the, the two villages that are 40 miles apart and their lifestyles are very, very, very similar. Um, and I forgot to mention this about fish. What they do is they eat a ton of, uh, one of them eats a ton of fish and, and the other one just kind of does more of a plant-based diet. And what they found with the fish, um, the fish eaters, is that they were significantly lower cholesterol levels, so the lifestyles were the same. And what they're finding with tea is, is the same when we have um, people who come from, like say China, where they drink a lot of tea. They come here and they adopt our lifestyle, but they still keep the tea in, right? And what they're finding is that their incidences of um, some of our disease states is much lower um, when they have the tea in. If they come to our country and they don't have the tea in, so they really adopt our, our lifestyle pretty fully, they very quickly catch up to the same incidences of um, cancer and heart disease. So the recommendations for tea consumption is one to three cups daily for health benefits. Greater protection as your consumption increases, actually. Brewed tea has more health benefits than instant tea. And tea bags are as potent as loose tea, possibly more because tea bags um, there's greater surface area. They've been pulverized more. There's greater surface area for the polyphenols to, to come out into the fluid. And you should brew your tea for at least three minutes and squeeze that tea, that tea bag after it's been brewed and get a lot of that polyphenols out of there. So we believe, too, that black tea is just as effective as green. Green has been studied widely because it's, it is consumed in many countries that have low rates of cancer and heart disease, so they studied green tea. But they're finding that they believe that black tea um, is going to have uh, pretty much the same results. So tomatoes, there's ample evidence that they play a role in reducing risk for cardiovascular disease. If you've ever heard of lycopene, that's a powerful antioxidant. And it's in tissues of, when it's in tissues of men who have suffer, suffered heart attacks, were compared with those that hadn't suffered um, heart attacks, what they find is those that with heart attacks had a lot lower levels of lycopene. One study compared carotenoid levels among patients um, and found lycopene to be the most protective against a heart attack. So what lycopene does is it combines with other powerful antioxidants, again, to neutralize free radicals that would otherwise damage your cells and your cell membranes. So it reduces the potential for inflammation, which reduces the severity and progression of your atherosclerosis, which is the plaque um, on the inside of the arteries. Um, also, tomatoes are rich in potassium, niacin, vitamin B6, folate, which is a great heart-healthy combination, which helps lower the homocysteine levels and blood pressure. 
Now, processed tomatoes are actually of more benefit than fresh, right? So there's a few things that sometimes people, you know, don't realize that heat or processing actually increases the nutrient quality of certain, certain fruits and vegetables, and tomatoes is one of those things. So actually ketchup has a lot of lycopene in it. Um, any canned tomato products, pasta sauce, are very high in lycopene. Um, one of the tricks that you can do, it's at the bottom, is if you just cook your fresh tomatoes just like really briefly, just to get them warm, it causes the cell walls to burst and more lycopene is actually released, so it's going to be higher in antioxidants. Um, order pizza with extra sauce. Saute cherry tomatoes and some olive oil and herbs and then toss over pasta or serve as a side dish. Use sun-dried tomatoes and sandwiches. Toss a can of uh, diced tomatoes into your soups and your stews. Get it, just get it in where you can. And just remember that um, the processed version is gonna be higher. Um, so even if you don't wanna eat, because we're telling you not to eat as much processed foods, right? But even if you can heat those tomatoes up just a little bit. Now soy um, is very, very, very effective at lowering cholesterol in those that have high levels. So the FDA says when, consu when consumed as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol, it can reduce your risk of coronary heart disease. In October 1999, the FDA began allowing soy food manufacturers to actually make health claims on their packages because the evidence is so strong. Um, soy is derived from soybeans, one of the most widely consumed sources of protein worldwide. Some of the studies have shown um, that consumption of soy protein results in significant reductions in cholesterol, and 9%, LDL cholesterol by 12, which is your bad, and then triglycerides by 10. Um, we don't really know how it's working, why it works like that, um, but we do know they've actually come up with a particular amount. So if someone, you know, one of the things when, when, when someone comes to me for counseling and says, I really have high LDL, help me try to get that down. I'm gonna give them a lot of information but they may not want to try soy, right? So there's some other things we'll focus on, but it is very effective. So those that are open-minded to it, um, I can tell you it's very, very effective. Soybeans can be eaten whole, fresh, or frozen, edamame, or dried soy nuts. And the ideal amount is 25 grams per day for cholesterol-lowering ability of soy. So when you hear these recommendations, we want 25 grams every day, not just a couple of days a week, right? You want every day. So um, Tofu has about 18 to 20 grams, four ounces. So some people will use that in stir fries. They have the silk tofu, which is more of the, it's not hard, it's more liquidy. People put that in their smoothies to get that tofu in there and get that soy protein. One soy burger, 10 to 12 grams, a cup of soy milk, 11 grams, a soy protein bar, 14 grams, um, a fourth a cup of roasted soy nuts, 15 grams. You can check the protein content on the label actually. And if you're eating a soy product, all that protein is usually going to be soy based, right? Now, what about processed versus real soy, you know? So when I can, I steer people towards using tofu, soy nuts, edamame, that type of stuff because it's less processed. Because um, there's always controversy with the processed versions of everything. And so right now, processed soy, they're like, eh, I don't know. You know, the GMOs that are in it, all kinds of stuff. Does, what's the effect on that going to be? And right now, um, there's nothing definitive enough for me to be able to make a specific recommendation. I just always try to, try to, try to get you to do the less processed um, that you can. Um, and it's, that's always going to be healthier for you. People that already have existing thyroid um, issues, a lot of times um, we don't have them do soy because it actually um, can block the effect of your medication and, make your, and so make your, your thyroid condition actually worse. I have never seen any information in, that I can come to. I know that a lot of people say soy kills your thyroid gland. Some people, I'll see, you know, there's a lot of nutrition information out there and where people get it. I know Jillian Michaels is a big one. Don't eat soy, it'll kill your thyroid gland like it did Oprah. That's what she says. I heard her say that like 50 million times. There's actually no evidence that soy damages thyroid glands. Um, people that have existing thyroid disease, though, um, um, sometimes have to limit that. So tips for consumption, add soy protein powder into shakes, purchase dried cereals and breads containing soy, and no, soy sauce is not a good source 